long ago. VFIO, um, who's heard of VFIO? Great, so I don't have to explain all the slides that are coming up here. Um, what is VFIO about? It's uh, really just a framework, um, in, in general, framework to allow you to not use the traditional model of accessing devices through a Linux interface and through Linux abstraction layers, but instead um, go and do it directly. Like you can just straight on pass, like access your device and you get um, all its, all its um, MIO regions, all its interrupts, everything you need to use to, to control and, and control a device and for a device to tell you what's happening. Um, you can do all of that from a user space application. That's the basic idea of it. Um, <clears throat> now, the current implementation of, um, of VFIO uh, is basically completely focused on PCI and PCI only and it leverages a, a, a few cool features of PCI. Um, like, for example, you only have a really limited range of, of MMIO regions that can also be PIO, which we don't have some anywhere else, but at least um, PCI does have those. Uh, and it, it is, PCI has very strict streamlined variants and, and ideas on how interrupts work. Um, it has a really nice config space interface where you have things like reset bits and bus mastering bits and you can actually steer things um, reasonably well in a generic fashion. Whereas if you look at platform devices, it's an open green field. You can do anything you like. Interrupts can be any random thing, whatever the device vendor thinks is gonna happening. Um, resources is, is completely a big mass. You can just have um, random chunks of memory somewhere in your address space uh, be assigned to this one device. And um, it's, it's completely freely describable on where exactly a device lies. Um, you can have uh, devices that are part, like sub-devices as part of your big device that you basically divide your device into smaller devices, you need to expose those somehow, and you, um, you can even have interlinks between devices, but let's go into this whole discussion now. Um, so what, what are all the resources? Um, just that we are all up to speed on roughly where, where we're going. Um, the, uh, this is just an example device that Stuart was posting a while back. Um, this is a PCI device, which means it's, uh, this is a, a power PC device, which means it's about five orders of magnitude easier than anything you see on an ARM device tree. Um, there's no clocks in there, there's no regulators, no whatever else there is. But it still has a few important um, pieces that, that you might be aware of. You got the REC property up there, which basically means, um, there, you see it, REC? Um, this, is, this is your registers for that, your, for that specific device. It means at offset 101300, it's four bytes of registers. This is free format in device tree. Um, you could, it could be anything. It could even be, um, say, 64-bit um, numbers, which means you have two numbers each, and it, it's all device tree specific. But um, the idea is the same. You could, you could have multiple of those as an array, so you could have 10 different regions for this, um, register regions for this device, and you know, never know which region really is describing what. This is all device specific. So the driver needs to know okay, region number five is what I need to steer for something. Um, it can have, it does have interrupts, but only in this case, only on sub-devices. So you can have devices below your device that again have reg properties that are part of the ranges up there. So the ranges tell you inside of sub-devices, sub -devices, then again, go and have uh, different regs. And um, these interrupts go through a completely separate hierarchy from the um, from your MMIO hierarchy and uh, basically allow you to link a device to a specific interrupt line, whatever that means. This is all implementation specific again. Um, I'm like, describing what device tree looks like. I know you could apply most of the same ideas on, on ACPI just so you're not getting afraid of it. Um, if we want to pass through a device like this, we actually want to pass through the whole thing. Right? We want to be able to pass through the full DMA controller because that's the entity that we look at. This is our granularity that we want to pass into the gas. We can't just split it off into, um, into DMA channel one and two. We, just, we, we can't actually grasp a device on those granularities. So we need to express this too. Um, I don't, quite, I don't have really have an idea on how this really would work out at the end of the day, but at least we have a hint, which is down here. This is um, our IOMU ID, so we know at least that this device, only on this granularity where FSL LAODN is standing, only on that granularity we can actually split it off. Um, we, we can control it on an IOMU level, which is a reasonably natural fit of assigning devices. Um, now that you all know everything about device tree, if you didn't, we can still discuss. Um, 
we have a few issues. Um, so how do we handle sub-devices? I, I don't really, as I said, I don't really have a good idea on, on how this would work out. Um, but we do have a few things to consider. The first is um, how, do, how does a user space application know that there are sub-devices? There are essentially two ways of doing this. Um, the first is uh, you open a device node somewhere and then um, you poke at that device node and try to find out what, is, what actually lies below this device node. Um, the other alternative is that um, you ex expect user space to um, be a bit more clever on how to, how to evaluate or how to, how to find out where, what your device looks like. So that, um, okay, give me, let me give you two examples. Um, when we were designing an API for VFIO on platform devices two years ago, we were basically designing an API for VFIO on device tree. So one of the IOCTLs you would do to VFIO was um, you would ask the kernel, please give me a pre-interpreted version of device tree for all of my device and all of the sub-devices that you would just only poke at dev VFIO or something to um, tell you every single piece of information you need to know about devices below it and about this device and all the parameters and whatever you have. Whereas for um, the version we are looking at now, um, we say, well, all we need to know is the path and the number of sub-devices in the hierarchy, but we don't really need to know any specifics because you can figure those out from the device tree because you can always assume you have access to the device tree and you take information from there. Is there any idea in the audience on what approach is actually better and any ideas on where things don't work out? Anthony has lots of ideas where things don't work out question because I don't know anything about what uh, device trees or these types of systems. Is there an equivalent to LSPCI where you can enumerate the devices, the platform devices in a sort of structured way um, at all? Or is it just you cat the device tree and you just it's, read the tree? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, LSPCI is basically find proc device tree. What I'm asking is, if I were a user today and I wanted to look at the devices I had on my system, would I dump a text version of the device tree and read the device tree, or is there any kind of programmatic interface today, whether it's Dbus, whether it's um, a, a command line tool? Has this problem been solved anywhere else in terms of enumerating physical devices? Uh, Scholars are saying it, was, it should be show up in specific CVS. Um, you can also, you don't have to have a text representation of, of device tree. Um, you can always use a file system representation of device tree in PROC device tree. So there's a file system in PROC device tree, which gives you a hierarchical file system representation of your device tree. So once you have the path to your device inside of that hierarchical representation in PROC device tree, you can always just go and poke at that one, which makes it reasonably easy to do from user space. So does this make sense? Okay. Um, the really big question I have on this is um, once, like if, if we look at the ARM ecosystem uh, and its evolvement towards ACPI over time now, um, how would this work with an ACPI based platform device? We do not have any, anything today um, where you could just go and say, oh yeah, I got it, my device is HID Blafu and I, um, I want to find all the properties and, and call ACPI functions to find out my regions um, for this particular device. How could we handle user space figuring out all properties for a device um, from user space? Which we need to because um, we need to basically take these devices and pass them into a VM. Which means the VM again needs to have some view of properties of things, um, how this device works. And some of them it might want to know from the host. Some of them it might want to invent. But we definitely want to have some way of referring to the host to figure out what's going on. Uh, Is this not already exposed in CISFS for ICPI devices? I don't, I don't know what exactly you have in CISFS. I would assume the only thing you have in CISFS is for devices that are bound to a driver that exposes something again, right? 
and this would be a new driver, so it doesn't expose anything to you. Do you also have, in has anything that shows users something for generic ACPI devices? You do? I thought yeah. we did, yeah. So we can basically use the same info, the same ideas um, as on device tree. Uh, yeah, he was just saying that there, there, is, there is a sys interface for it, so it would just work out, which is great. Um, that means we have all our problems solved. Um, this is getting also interesting. I, I don't have a, a slide with a headline for this, but um, one thing we need to consider on, on ARM is you might have a, a device and a kernel on the host that is running device tree and a guest that wants to run EFI and ACPI inside it. So you actually need to be able to somehow convert one to the other and expose, like read both. We're working on that kind of translation for other reasons anyway. You're going to see the same devices being plugged into boards which have different types of firmware. We have to have that kind of translation from one way of expressing the same information to the other. So that's a problem we were discussing elsewhere anyway. Right, so my, my idea of how this, how this would work um, is that in our case, QMU is the user space driver for a VFAO platform device. And now um, QMU would go in and um, basically only get this, this device, um, no, this device, character device, which gives it, which can only expose regions and interrupt lines. And we were discussing earlier maybe uh, regulators and clocks, but it basically only gives you access to a few resources. It does not tell you properties of itself because you would, be, you would fetch the properties from PROC device tree or from SysFS if you really need them. And then QMU would have to have a reader interface that reads device tree information and that reads SysFS information. And most of the information would actually, it would have to come, like, make up on its own to expose into the guest. And then it would know my guest is, wants to do ACPI, so I, I assemble this piece of ACPI code that I just drove into my guest. 90% of that would be just a template inside of QMU code, and the 10% that vary depending on what your host configuration looks like, it would take from the host, basically. That's, that's the model I have currently in my mind. Not, I haven't actually written the code that would do it, so I don't know if it works out, but I would assume it does. So QMU would convert to the right kind of information, be it ACPI or device tree, according to the firmware that happens to be running on the guest today? According to the, well, you would, you would basically, you would have to, you would have to know whether you, um, your guest is running something device tree based or something ACPI based. Either way, if you want to create, um, well, firmware configuration snippets on the fly. I think there's a detail here that probably isn't obvious, and that's that at least for um, device tree guests, QMU is actually generating the device tree, not just the firmware. So um, there's an active discussion in QMU right now about whether QMU should be generating ACPI tables. And obviously, on platforms where you can have either device tree or ACPI, it becomes complicated because now QMU has to decide whether to do ACPI or, or device trees. It, it depends so that, that I, can, I can imagine like um, if, if you use an interface like firmware config, which is our current power virtualized interface, um, you could just have two properties in there. One says um, read, read ACPI chunks and one is read device tree chunks. You generate both and depending on what your guest wants to use, um, you just pull, out, pull down the, the ones you actually care about. Right? Um, so it's not an unsolvable problem, but we need to Currently, we, we live in a world where um, we assume our, our guest is static as soon as it comes to non-enumerable devices, which is platform devices. And um, that is, is a really big nightmare if you want to dynamically add devices to your device because you suddenly need to also touch your guest's firmware. And that's always a big pain. You don't necessarily have an ISL compiler on your power machine. Oh, yeah, crying. Um another, another big issue that we have um, is Say um, your guest starts writing, like using a device. You, you pass in a device into your guest, the guest goes in and, and, and accesses that device. Um, now your, your VM dies. Um, just like the guest uh, agent, we just are really bad programmers, and your guest agent just, um, you, you, your QM, your process just dies and tech falls. Um, now you have this device still processing data, it like gets network packets, for example. 
how do you make sure that this device is not spilling anything into your um, normal address space or into any other address space. First step is easy, right? I mean, once you close your VFIO file descriptor, um, you would kill off all the IOMU mappings. Now, you basically have a device that is trying to DMA, but it can't because the IOMU is blocking it, so everything is, everything is fine. Now, you restart QMU, and your next QMU process maps everything in again uh, and is enabling DMA. So this device now can actually DMA into your address space of that new guest. How do we make sure it doesn't? Expose an IOMMU to the guest, and the guest won't enable mapping for that device until it's initialized it. I was afraid you wanted to say, we might say that. Um, yes, that is one way of handling it. I just don't know if the benefit of it is great enough for doing it. Um, if you have any other ideas, there, so the ideas that were floating around, um, I think it was Christopher, I remember, um, somebody was mentioning that uh, you could have a hypercall where the guest just tells you, okay, now I can use this device. It's one idea. Um, another idea that I had is, um, since you need to have knowledge about your device in QMU, um, since you're assembling device tree chunks, you're assembling ACPI chunks, you need to figure out if you have multiple devices with different interlinks. I think it's the next slide. Um, you need to figure out how, that you actually need two devices to have a working combination of, like a working system of multiple devices that work together. Um, since you need all of that information in QMU anyways, you could just as well put reset in there. Right. So your um, QMU process can then reset the device to be at the same state. So the guest um, basically sees a device as it would in a real world environment as well, which is power on state. The only issue I can see on that one is devices that don't, do, that don't, don't know how to reset. Yes, they exist. Is it really that hard to expose an IOMU? The Intel setup is designed for it. Power is designed to be turtles all the way down. Right, it's not, as I was saying, not an embedded. It depends. Um, it's, it's partially possible. The question is on, so the free scale power IOMU is reasonably flaky. It's almost a guard with a few additions. Um, so it's not really easy to have the guest give the guests the same flexibility, the same li very limited flexibility that we already have on the host. Um, so that, that there might be a mismatch between what you, what you can do and what you can't do, and you can't expose to the guest that something doesn't work, so you would have to do a power virtualized IOMU, which then, then you want to run U-boot in your guest, and suddenly U-boot needs to know how to control an IOMU to actually, which it doesn't on those boxes today. And it's just, um, it's getting really hard. So I actually think doing a reset is, is more sane. Um, for the guest, because the guest gets to see the exact same view that it does um, as it was getting powered on. So it's more similar to how hardware works. But if you have other good ideas, I'd be happy to hear them. I, mean, it's, I haven't really solved the crisis thing. It's ugly. Yeah, inter-device relationship. Um, some, like in, in some hardware, you can have so my, my example is always that I, I'm, I'm just completely making up. There are other devices that are more complicated that actually do have this, but the one I'm making up is, imagine you have an HCI controller and a DMA controller, and your HCI controller needs your DMA controller to, di to drive any DMA. You need to pass both into your gas to actually do DMA. So you need to somehow um, make sure that, for starters, in device tree, that the link exists, so that um, your HCI device links to your... Um, your DMA device to actually be able to drive DMA. And the other thing that you need to do is you need to preferably pass both into the guest at the same time so that the guest sees a consistent view of the world to have both devices. Because the HCI controller without DMA controller doesn't make any sense for it. So to take it to the next granularity step, basically like, say, a PCI card, right, where you have both at the same time. Um, how do we express this in any of the layers. VFIO would basically just expose a DMA controller and an HCI controller. It doesn't know about that relationship, really. Um, so who, who actually does know that those devices belong together? And, and so my idea on this was um, that we take a, um, we create a QEMU driver that says AHCI with DMA, and then it takes, it grabs both VFIO devices 
and exposes both to the guest. Does your Ireland U driver know to group those devices together to start with? The HCI controller cannot do DMA. The DMA controller does do DMA. Right? So only the only, Ireland U driver only knows about one of them, really. So the IMU, for the IMU, I mean, IOMU's point of view, I don't know. It, uh, they could even be separate devices with different. You, you could have two different devices um, that both can do DMA. Um, and both could work on their own almost as it's just not used. They're just not useful. Um, like I know. I don't know the details of all the portals at in free scan networking chips, but they basically look like that. You do have different devices that do DMA each other and and do have lots of intercommunication between each device, so they just go within each other, and then at the end you just have something that gets gets it out into. MOE and caches and whatever. Yeah, that, yeah. So, so they can be controlled separately, they just don't make sense on their own. Yeah, it wouldn't solve the problem all the way up the stack anyway, but it, I mean, it seems like we're getting into device-specific fixes, like every layer. We basically do, yeah. So essentially what happens is, well, so, so this, or this expo imposes, this and the, the reset and the device tree assembly and everything, this imposes that we definitely do have to have a device-specific user space driver, which means either a, a, a real genuine driver in user space or QMU with a chunk of stub code that uses generic VFIO stuff for mapping regions for doing uh, interrupt layering, but also a specific piece of code that knows how to reset device, how to set up the device tree, how to do things. If you have a general purpose DMA controller that can be used to... Is it louder? Sorry? If you have a general purpose DMA controller that can be used to suck data from anywhere and spew it out somewhere else, you can't necessarily say in advance, oh, this is associated with that device over there, because it isn't. Right, but you could say that my guest needs to have one. So one of the nice things about VFIO is that it preserves the model that we only trust QMU as much as we trust the guest. Um, and uh, a misbehaving QMU can't do any more damage than the guest could if it was doing pass-through. When you talk about a user space driver for doing the right grouping and stuff like that, that violates that sort of assumption. So I wonder if it's better to have stub drivers in the kernel, much like there is for UIO. Um, so with UIO, in order to do interrupts and stuff like that, you have to have a little stub driver that ha fills out all the right information. Presumably, we could have a grouping mechanism. Um, it would also give you an enumeration mechanism because you could see which devices were available. Um, it could also do the reset logic, too. Um, so you could end up with a, with a little VFIO platform driver for all of the device types that you want to support pass-through for. When we were talking earlier, it seems like the VFIO platform driver is really just kind of a shim where you're going to have multiple backends in the host to protect the host, and they're going to need to be able to do various things. Let me, let me quickly, quickly go to one more of those headlines. Um, actually, the, the main thing, so where, here, um, this, is, this is where everything falls apart. Um, so in, our, in the view of the world that I was just exposing, like ex just explaining where you have a fully generic um, kernel driver, and a very like reasonably specific, but only halfway specific user space driver, um, there, which is QMU. There are two cases where it completely falls apart, and your your case is, is a reasonably nice one as well. It's just not quite as bad. So, um, if you have multiple devices that only work well if they bound together, um, that the worst case that can happen is that they don't work well. You don't break your host. So it's not a bad thing if if you don't group them together. And in fact, users might want to. So um, on, on free-scale networking chips, you could, for example, use one of those um, wing processing things that get, get data from A to B, um, just as well for AMP communication between two CPUs. Um, it would work the same way, where, where you really only want to have this one specific device and not the whole bulk of them. So exposing them as only the single small granularity piece might make sense in a few certain use cases. It's the driver's responsibility to figure out whether that use case is useful or the other use case is useful. It's also harder to um, bind to, to expose multiple devices that are 
actually the different devices from the host's platform driver point of view as a single blob rather than expose them as single VFIO devices. How do you bind this to the single one instance that you then expose to user space? Right. How do you do the grouping? Um, the two parts where I just fall apart, where I do fully agree with you, uh, is suspend and the reset part. The reset de can definitely go wrong. If you, um, I, don't, I don't have a good answer to, I mean, except for doing it in kernel, I don't have a good answer to how to do this, the, the whole reset stuff completely um, bulletproof so that I know that if I take a, a device that I did assign to a guest and then reassign to the host, that definitely nothing does fall apart. So doing it in there might actually, doing it in the kernel might make sense. The question is, do we have to have it or do we sometimes trust our user space? Um, the other one is suspend. So if you want to have an ARM device and you suspend a, that ARM device, how do you get from, um, well, the whole logic on I'm, I'm shutting down some clocks and I'm, I'm turning down some regulators so that my device is, is in really low power state, all of that now lives in, um, in your guest. How do you make a host suspend and the guest not realize that you're suspending or the guest not stopping you from suspending? And how do you ensure that when the guest wants to do something, it doesn't actually blow up your device on the host? So how do you know the limits of where you can control and configure something? And there it, might, it does make sense to have some, some uh, code in, in the host as well. But um, to, how much time do I have? Less than five minutes? OK. Um, Anthony was just asking if we can suspend with VFIO right now with PCI. And yes, we can. We support uh, power management. So the guest can put the device in D3. And it's kind of a VFIO managed. Alex? Uh, I think it's working. Okay. The, we don't currently have a pass through right now for the host suspend to tell the guest that it's suspending, but that's just a signal that needs to be implemented. Host suspend. Right. Well, we know how to solve it on PCI. We just haven't done it yet. We just need a signal QMU. And then we know that when QMU writes to the power management register that it suspended the device and the driver and the host can then go on with suspend. We were talking earlier that uh, it's yet another device specific backend in VFIO host for platform devices because they don't have a standard way to suspend a device. We, we, could, we could do some assumptions like, oh yeah, when the guest configures the clock to something below a threshold and we assume it actually did successfully suspend or not. Um, it's, it's really flaky. Um, another thing I just, you know, this is just half, half a minute just to, so you kind of get an idea about it. Um, clocks, and regulators, clocks and regulators are basically um, additional resources. So um, a, a device driver does not only have access to memory regions and interrupts on, on an ARM device tree platform based uh, world but it can also configure clocks, like how, how, how much frequency do I have on my, on my device, how much voltage do I pull up on my device, which device drivers need to modify. So um, on ARM, a UART, for example, gets a different clock rate depending on the baud rate. Um, so you need to actually manage, manage that from a guest driver's point of view. Um, so we need to expose those into user space as well, so that user space drivers or virtual machines can then go and configure those. Um, but that's, that's a reasonably straightforward, easy thing. Um, uh, yeah. All right, the question is, um, how do you do this with a complicated clock tree? You expose a paravirtualized clock setting method, which you can ask, can I do this? And then it says, no, sorry, you can't, or yes, sure, go ahead, um, for no good, no, known good values, exactly the same way you do in the clock API and the kernel. So from the kernel's point of view, you just get a list of, of frequencies, or I don't know, how, how, do you, how do you set a clock in, in the kernel? All right, so um, what you're saying is the, the clock, so you basically um, just say, I want to have my, my device or my, my clock number five configured to 100 megahertz, and that's, um, that's all, all the information that you pass into the clock framework and the kernel. 
and then from there it configures the clock tree to actually get your, your clock into that state. Um, or it tell, tells you, no, sorry, I cannot, right? Um, you would do the exact same in a virtual machine. You, don't, you would not expose a real clock tree. You would just expose a power virtualized clock, clock setting framework which passes this kernel interface into the virtual machine. So the virtual machine says, I want to configure it to 100 megahertz. Then that goes in, does an octal on VFIO device, says, I want to configure clock 5 on 100 megahertz. It calls the in kernel for clock framework on clock number 5. That one goes in and says, sure, go ahead. Um, I, I configured it, and then it goes back. Um, it, it's basically you have to take it in the abstraction layer above because we do not know and we do not ever want to know in user space about the topology. The driver doesn't care either. You were talking about the vert IO being a pass through, and with clocks, it can't be a pass through. Hmm? I just didn't hear it. It worked. Part. Don't worry about it. All right. Um, same goes for regulators. Um, we would have to have a new API to just send those, say, uh, like do those. Um, Binding is another interesting thing, which I don't think, before we do binding. Um, We're pretty much out of time. Yeah. Is there any final questions that we have, that you guys have on, you're not quite sure what VFI of a platform actually is? Or how it would work, or any, any other bullet holes you see where um, a generic, let me take a random device from my host and pass it into my guest as a abstract interface thing does not work out. So we're currently trying to find situations in which this whole abstraction layer just completely falls apart, like suspend, for example. If you have other ideas on where it does fall apart, scream now or be silent forever. That means you'll actually merge you know, um, driver-specific, device-specific support in QMU for things that are going to be directly assigned, right? We need it in the kernel, too. My only concern from QMU, well, well, this sucks, but I don't know of a better solution. So um, my only concern would be QMU shouldn't have um, more privileges uh, than it would with VFI or PCI. So we, we, sh we can't have a model where we're relying on QMU to enforce um, you know, essentially isolation with PCI pass-through. What is your feeling about duplicating code that otherwise exists in the kernel of QMU, for example, you set up on a device? Are you okay with that, or do you think that thing should never go inside QMU? The question is reset in QMU. Yeah, the question well, is... an example, but as a general principle, that having device-specific support for devices we're going to directly design in QMU, if that's something we're going to have to have issues with. So, the thing that makes the most sense to me is what I was saying earlier, where VFIO would implement a, essentially the reset logic, and it would be duplicated compared to the normal driver, mm -hmm. but it would still be a kernel interface that you could do reset from. Um, I think that makes sense not just from the perspective of QMU, but if for some reason somebody wanted to write a user space device driver for the device. So if we have the platform stubs in the kernel, we wouldn't need the reset logic in QMU, right? We could use that also. Right. Regardless of QMU, if I'm getting if I'm getting DMA faults from a device, I want to kill it. Yeah. Um, so we need that reset functionality. We maybe need to take a closer look at what we have on power with EEH for shutting devices down. I haven't paid any attention to that for years, but maybe we want a generic reset at kind of the bus driver level within Linux device tree. Yeah. But but yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you, Alex.